Can you imagine an airplane sliced nearly into by an enemy fighter, still managing to fly home? It sounds like something straight out of a Hollywood movie, but this is the incredible true story of a B-17 flying fortress named All-American. This isn't just a tale of survival. It has a testament to one of the most rugged aircraft ever built and the sheer grit of its crew. Today, we may go to dive deep into the legendary incident that produced one of the most iconic photographs of World War II, a picture that proves just how tough the flying fortress truly was. The date was February 1st, 1943. The skies over Tunis, North Africa, were a hornet's nest of combat. A formation of B-17s from the 97th Bomb Group was returning from a raid on German hell seaports. Their mission was to disrupt enemy supply lines, a crucial task in the North African campaign. Among them was the B-17F, Serial number for 12406, affectionately known as All-American. Piloted by Lieutenant Kendrick R. Bragg, the ten man crew had already faced heavy anti-aircraft fire and swarms of enemy fighters. They were battle-hardened, but nothing could have prepared them for what was about to happen. As they neared the coast, a pack of German Messerschmitt Bf-109 fighters pounced on the bomber formation. The air became a chaotic ballet of machine gun fire and roaring engines. The gunners of all American were blazing away, trying to fend off the relentless attacks. Suddenly, to be F-109s honed in on the lead bomber of the formation. One of the fighters, either through pilot error or perhaps a final, desperate act of aggression after being critically hit, went into an uncontrolled dive. Its trajectory was a collision course, not with the lead bomber, but directly with All-American. There was no time to react. The Messerschmitt slammed into the rear of the B-17 with catastrophic force. The impact was deafening, a violent shudder that ripped through the entire airframe. The German fighter disintegrated, but not before its wing sliced through the fuselage of All-American like a giant cleaver. It carved a massive, diagonal gash just forward of the tail section. From the right side, just behind the baldrit, the cut went all the way through to the left side, ending just below the tail gunner's position. The entire tail of the aircraft was now hanging on by a thread. The immediate aftermath was chaos. The wind howled through the gaping hole in the plane's body. The controls went slack and the bomber began a sickening, uncontrolled descent. Inside the severed tail section, the tail gunner, Staff Sergeant Sam Sarpolis, was trapped. He was completely isolated from the rest of the crew, staring out at the sky through a massive hole in his own aircraft, the ground spinning wildly below. The left horizontal stabilizer and its corresponding elevator were gone completely sheared off in the collision. The right stabilizer was badly damaged. The rudder was partially jammed. Essentially, the pilots had lost most of their ability to control the aircraft's pitch and yaw. In the cockpit, Lieutenant Bragg fought for control. He and his co-pilot, Lieutenant Godfrey Engel, wrestled with the yokes, their muscles straining against the forces tearing their plane apart. The tail section was wobbling violently, threatening to break off completely at any moment. Every gust of wind, every slight movement, sent shudders through the crippled bomber. It was a miracle the plane was still in one piece. The structural integrity was compromised to a degree that, by all rights, should have been fatal. The only things holding the tail to the rest of the fuselage were a few inches of metal on the bottom of the plane and the control cables running to the tail surfaces. Down in the main fuselage, the crew sprang into action. They could see the tail swinging back and forth, flexing and twisting with every gust. They knew if it broke off, they were all doomed. 
Thinking fast, several crew members grabbed spare parachute harnesses. Scrambling over the catwalk of the bomb bay, they managed to reach the shredded rear of the fuselage. In a desperate act of improvisation, they began lashing the two sides of the broken fuselage together, using the sturdy webbing of the harnesses to create makeshift splints. They crisscrossed the cables, pulling them as tight as they could, trying to give the broken spine of their aircraft some semblance of rigidity. It was a race against time and physics. Meanwhile, in the isolated tail compartment, Sergeant Sarpoulos was fighting his own battle. Though trapped, he realized his twin. Fifty caliber machine guns were still functional. As other German fighters closed in, smelling blood and looking to finish off the crippled bomber, Sarpolis opened fire. From his precarious perch, he fought back, driving off the attackers and protecting his crewmates as they worked to save the plane. It was an act of incredible courage, firing at the enemy from inside a part of the aircraft that was literally hanging by a thread. Back in the cockpit, Lieutenant Bragg was performing a masterclass in aviation. With the elevators and rudder barely functioning, he had to fire the plane using only the engines and the ailerons a technique known as differential thrust. By carefully adjusting the power to the four engines, he could gently steer the aircraft, nudging its nose left or right. To control his altitude, he had to use subtle adjustments in power and wing trim. It was like trying to balance a plate on a needle point. Any sudden or aggressive maneuver would put too much stress on the damaged fuselage, and the tail would snap off. He had to fly with surgical precision, nursing the wounded bird through the sky. The journey back to their base in Biskra, Algeria, was an agonizing ninety minutes. Every second was filled with tension. The crew watched the makeshift repairs, praying they would hold. Bragg kept his touch on the controls as light as possible. The rest of the bomber formation, witnessing this unbelievable sight, slowed down and flew alongside all American, offering what little protection they could. They were escorting a ghost, a plane that had no business still being in the air. As they approached the airfield, another challenge loomed, landing. How do you land a plane that's broken in half? The normal landing procedure was out of the question. Lowering the flaps or the landing gear would change the aerodynamics to drastically and could be the final straw that broke the plane as back. Bragg decided to attempt a long, straighten, high-speed belly landing. He brought the plane in fast and flat, aiming to slide it along the runway on its belly to minimize the impact forces. As the ground rushed up to meet them, the entire crew braced for the end. With incredible skill, Bragg eased the bomber down. It touched the earth with a grinding screech of metal on it, sliding for hundreds of feet before finally skidding to a halt. Silence dot then. Disbelief. They had made it. The ground crew rushed out to the runway, their jaws on the floor. What they saw was real. The All-American sat there, its tail connected by mere scraps of metal and parachute straps, a massive wound carved into its side. The tail gunner, Sam Sarpolis, was finally freed from his compartment, shaken but unharmed. Incredibly, despite the catastrophic collision and the harrowing flight, not a single member of the ten-man crew was seriously injured. The photograph taken of all American on the ground that day became legendary. It circulated throughout the Allied forces as a powerful piece of propaganda, a symbol of the B-17's legendary toughness and the resilience of its crews. It showed everyone that the Flying Fortress could absorb an unbelievable amount of punishment and still bring its boys home. The plane itself was, of course, a total write-off. The damage was far too extensive to repair. It was salvaged for parts, but its legacy was already cemented. The story of All-American is more than just a war story. 
It's a perfect illustration of the bond between a crew and their machine. It highlights the ingenuity and courage of ordinary men placed in extraordinary circumstances. From the pilot's delicate handling to the crewman's quick-thinking repairs with parachute harnesses, every action contributed to their survival. And it forever proved that the nickname Flying Fortress wasn't just a name, it was a promise of strength, a promise that this incredible aircraft would do everything in its power to protect its crew and bring them home even when it was broken, battered, and nearly torn in two. Imagine you're a bomber crew in World War II, flying deep into enemy territory. Your plane is a fortress, a B-17, bristling with guns. But today, the sky over Bremen, Germany, is a hornet's nest of fire and steel. This is the story of ye old pub, and it's a tale that almost defies belief. On December 20th, 1943, Second Lieutenant Charles Charlie Brown was piloting his B-17 on a bombing run. It was supposed to be just another mission, but it quickly turned into a fight for survival. Anti-aircraft fire, what the crews called flak, ripped through the sky like black clouds of death. Explosions rocked the plane, tearing jagged holes in its aluminum skin. Then came the fighters. Swarms of German Messerschmitts and Farquhars descended on the bomber formation. Yield Pub was right in the thick of it. For ten minutes, which must have felt like an eternity, they were under constant attack. The sounds would have been deafening, the roar of the engines, the chatter of their own machine guns, and the terrifying percussion of enemy cannons striking their aircraft. The damage was catastrophic. The plexiglass nose cone was completely shattered, exposing the bombardier and navigator to the freezing. High altitude air, the number to engine was knocked out, and the number for was sputtering, barely clinging to life. Hydraulic lines were severed, and the electrical systems were failing. The plane's internal oxygen supply, vital for survival at 27,000 feet, was compromised. Worst of all was the human cost. The tail gunner, Sergeant Hugh Eckenode, was killed instantly by a direct cannon hit. His section of the plane was a wreck. Six other crew members were wounded, some severely. Charlie Brown himself was hit in the shoulder by shrapnel. The plane's defensive firepower was all but gone. Of the eleven machine guns, only the top turret and one waist gun were still operational, and even those were struggling. The old pub was a sitting duck, a ghost of an aircraft, barely holding together. After the initial onslaught, Charlie Brown managed to pull his battered plane out of the formation. He was alone, deep in enemy airspace, and losing altitude fast. His navigator was wounded. His maps were frozen in blood, and he was disoriented, unknowingly. He was flying even deeper into Germany. That's when a lone German fighter appeared on their tail. It was a Messerschmitt BF-109, and at the controls was one of Germany's most experienced aces, Franz Stiegler. Stiegler already had 27 victories to his name. One more, and he would be awarded the Knight's Cross, Germany's highest military honor. Downing a crippled B-17 was supposed to be an easy kill. Stigler closed in, his finger on the trigger. He lined up the broken bomber in his sights. But as he got closer, he saw something that made him pause. The damage was unlike anything he'd ever witnessed on a plane that was still flying. He could see right through the fuselage, watching the terrified crewmen inside tending to their wounded comrades. He saw the tail gunner, slumped and lifeless, in his shattered turret. The plane wasn't a threat. It was a coffin, flying on a prayer. At that moment, Franz Stigler remembered the words of his commanding officer, a man he deeply respected. You follow the rules of war for you, not for your enemy. You fight by the rules to keep your humanity. 
he couldn't bring himself to shoot. To him, finishing off this crew would be no different from shooting at a man in a parachute. It was murder, not combat. He flew his fighter alongside the B-17's cockpit. Charlie Brown, dazed and bleeding, looked over and saw the German pilot just feet away. He braced for the final, fatal burst of cannon fire. He closed his eyes, expecting the end. But the shots never came. Instead, Stigler made eye contact with him. He gestured, trying to tell Brown to land his plane in Germany, where his crew would receive medical attention. When Brown shook his head and kept flying, Stigler tried to gesture for him to fight a neutral Sweden. Again, Brown didn't understand, his mind clouded by shock and lack of oxygen. Stigler knew the B-17 was flying towards German anti-aircraft batteries on the coast. They would finish the job he refused to do. So, he made a decision that could have cost him his own life. He positioned his fighter on the bomber's left wing, flying in formation. This act of flying alongside an enemy bomber would signal to German ground gunners that it was a captured plane being escorted, not a target. He was using his own aircraft as a shield. He escorted ye old pub over the North Sea, far enough out that they were clear of German defences. Once they were over open water, Stigler pulled up alongside Charlie Brown's cockpit one last time. He gave a crisp, formal salute, then peeled his fighter away and returned to Germany. He never reported the incident, knowing he'd be court-martialed and likely executed for sparing an enemy. Charlie Brown, against all odds, managed to fly his shattered bomber 250 miles across the North Sea and landed back in England. Upon landing, the ground crew was stunned. They couldn't believe the plane had made it back. Brown told his commanding officers what had happened about the German pilot who had spared them and escorted them to safety. He was ordered to keep it a secret. The military didn't want stories of honorable enemies, it could soften the resolve of other airmen. For over forty years, both men carried the memory of that day. Charlie Brown never forgot the face of the pilot who showed him mercy. Franz Stigler never knew if the B-17 he spared had actually made it home. After the war, Stigler moved to Canada and became a successful businessman. Charlie Brown stayed in the military and later worked for the State Department. In the late 1980s, Charlie Brown began searching for the pilot who saved his life. After years of searching archives in both the U.S. and Germany, he finally found him. In 1990, the two former enemies, now old men, met for the first time on the ground. They became the closest of friends, like brothers, for the rest of their lives. Their story is one of the most powerful testaments to the idea that even in the midst of the darkest conflicts, our shared humanity can shine through. It's a reminder that honor and compassion are not bound by a uniform or a flag. Thank you so much for watching. This story always gets to me, and I hope it moved you as well. If you enjoyed this video, please consider hitting that like button and subscribing to the channel for more incredible stories from history. We'll see you in the next one.